You're listening to the Matt Dudley Drumming Podcast. How's it going? Today, we're talking with Dr. Nadia Azar, who is a doctor of kinesiology and occupational biomechanics and biomedical engineering with concentrations in biomechanics and neurophysiology. (laughs) That's a lot to spit out, right? But... To make it simple, uh, Nadia is doing research on rock stars on stage and drummers, and I ran across her on Twitter where I was seeing she was hooking up heart monitors and different devices up to uh, some pretty well-named drummers, people like Mike Mangini and Rich Redman and Barry Kirch from Shinedown, and just measuring their statistics, their uh, their health stats, why they're up on stage, how many calories they're burning, what their heart rate is. So I thought it would be a great podcast episode for everybody, and also to just introduce her to all of you. So before I spill too much, let's jump into it. record button and we're just going to go ahead and jump into this thing so so it's awesome to meet you by the way you too yeah i've been i've been looking at well i found you through twitter so i was able to see a lot of the stuff you were doing and i don't know how but i've seen it maybe months back or maybe even a year ago or something like that i'd seen these posts where it would show you know like this drummer had this big uh picture going up saying that his heart rate was this and he had burned this many calories and i'm like man this is really interesting because you know i'd like to get in on this myself trying to figure out what was going on so anyway for everybody who's listening this is nadia azar is that how you say your last name yes azar oh man perfect nailed it (laughs) i was wondering about that yeah, I usually get Azar, but you you got it right the first time. So <laughs> Azar, all right, cool, perfect. And yet, for uh, for everybody that's listening, if you would just tell us a little bit about yourself, about what you do. Uh, well, I am uh, an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology at the University of Windsor. Um, so my job basically is to teach undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, I teach courses in biomechanics and neurophysiology. Um, But the other half of my job is to do research, and my research um, program, or the the stuff that I've been working on most recently, is on the physical demands of playing the drums. Um, So I look at everything from, I I kind of look at it in in two different approaches. One is drummers as athletes, and that's the stuff that you've seen online with uh, drummers, um, their heart rates and their energy expenditure during live performances. Um, and we're also going to be doing some work in terms of uh, like physical performance as well. Um, but my, my background and, and my, my training has been in injury prevention, ergonomics, um, and, uh, and things like that. So um, I'm also looking at playing the drums, the physical demands of playing the drums from that perspective in terms of um, the injuries that uh, drummers may acquire through repet- like repetitive use injuries or overuse injuries, that sort of thing. Um, and what are some of the risk factors that go along with that? And what can we do to maybe try to reduce? Because there are a lot of injuries. Um, and so what can we do to reduce the rates of injuries um, that drummers are uh, developing? And what are the most common ones? And what can we do to try to prevent those from happening? Yeah, perfect. So with with doing this research, I mean, with, did they just... Did they give you the option of what you wanted to research? Is this something that was chosen by you, or is this something that they gave to you? No, this is uh, this is entirely chosen by me. Um, I was doing. I mean, I've been I've been at the University of Windsor almost twelve years now as a professor, and I've been doing different research projects along the way. And this one kind of fell in my lap about three years ago. 
um, and just sort of like exploded <laughs> what I was doing at the time. And uh, I mean, I, I have a background in music. Uh, I'm, I don't know, I hesitate to call myself a drummer. I'm trying to relearn how to play the drums, but I did play a bit as a kid. Um, and uh, but no, I, I played the piano for nine years and dabbled in a bunch of other instruments. And so, you know, music's always been in my blood. I'm a, I'm a huge rock music fan, and so this project just kind of brought all of that together. And, and when I had the opportunity to to do this, I, I took it and ran with it. And um, you know, it's over the, over the not quite two years that I've been doing the energy expenditure study. I've I've recruited over 30 professional drummers who have done this now. Um, during live performances and, and it's been a lot of fun and it's been really neat um, you know really neat to see what the exertion looks like during during a show yeah and I, I totally want to get into that uh, going back talking about you said you were kind of into music growing up so well, more kind of <laughs> So yeah. what what was your experience like did, did you get to play drums much or did you ever own a kit or anything like that no, I never owned a kit. Um, so when when I was, uh, let's see, I was about 11 years old, my parents moved my family down to South Carolina for a year. And that was my first exposure to like band through school. Um, and one of the instruments we could play was snare drum. And uh, I wanted to do that, but my parents said no, because we were going back to Canada, um, you know, a year later, and that wouldn't have been an option for me to continue with in the school program. So I ended up going with the flute instead, um, did that for three years. But when, uh, let's see, it's probably the summer, I think I was about 14 years old, one of my best friends, uh, her cousin set up his drum set in her basement and taught us how to play. And so, well, taught us how to play, taught us how to play Ender Sandman. And so we spent all summer playing Ender Sandman over and over again. <laughs> and I could probably still bust that out if I had to, but, um, yeah, um, so that was, and then it kind of fizzled out after that. But I, uh, I have a couple of uncles who played the drums. I married a drummer. His brother is a drummer. So I've been surrounded by it, you know, my whole life. Um, so it wasn't a, a huge leap for me to to get involved with this. I mean, I, I do have a drum set in my living room. It just belongs to my husband. <laughs> cool. So did, yeah. does your husband is he playing any bands right now? No, he he did some of that when he was younger, and then it just he just plays recreationally. Now he's starting to get back into it, um, and would like to play eventually play some live stuff just for fun. Um, my brother-in-law though is a professional drummer. He plays with a, a local band. They do uh, a lot of weddings and events and things like that, um, and they they kind of I don't want to say just local area because they do go to other places and. We live in Windsor, which is right on the border with Detroit, Michigan. So they play a lot of shows in Michigan and in other parts of Ontario as well. So yeah, cool. Yeah. So see, you're you've been around it. You've been exposed. Absolutely. And I've, <laughs> you know, even before this project, I've been to. I'm a huge you know live music concert fan. So I've been to multiple concerts um, of all different genres. So yeah, you music know, is definitely a big part of my life. That's what I was thinking about when I'd seen all your posts about this stuff. I said, man, you know, maybe this was just a, a ploy for her to be able to go and meet all these, like, famous people and just have a good time, you know? <laughs> no, no. Um, I mean, certainly that's that's a highlight of it, getting to, you know, meet people that I've always sort of, you know, enjoyed their music and admired their talent and things like that. But, um, uh, you know, it, uh, it kind of – it got started – not as a ploy, but it got started through that, like a sort of fan experience. And then it just, I turned it into a project. Um, yeah. and, and a lot of people who were really interested in it and, you know, it just sort of snowballed, you know, someone heard about it. Oh, I really like to do that. So they reach out to me and then it just kind of grew from there. Yeah. <laughs> I was totally joking with you. Yeah. I, uh, I, I totally know you're, you're into this kind of stuff for sure. I definitely am, but I do get that a lot. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you first started this, who uh, who were some of the big name drummers when you first got started with it? So the this project first got started with Mike Mangini of Dream Theater. Um, it, uh, it it actually we got in touch through Twitter as well. Um, I had reached out to him. He had made a comment one day on Twitter about uh, his technique and and being. Uh, being sore because drumming is like a boxing type workout and so I, I 
tweeted back to him saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor uh, of kinesiology, I'd love to study your technique, message me if you're interested, thinking he was just going to ignore it and, you know, whatever. Um, but he didn't. He, he messaged me and we started talking about some research projects that we, you know, he might be able to get involved with. And through the course of all that, he one day said, you know, I wonder how many calories I burn while I'm on stage. And he made a guess based on the Klemper drumming project and some other studies that have been published. Um, and so I, I messaged him again and said, I, you know, I have some equipment. We could totally find out if you wanted to do this at a show and get your specific numbers. Um, and he was done with it. So we did. Um, so he was the first one. And then over the course of that, um, uh, Jeff Burroughs from the Tea Party, um, he lives in Windsor, a local guy, and uh, had heard about what I was doing with Mike and was interested as well. So did a couple shows with him, and then it just kind of – snowballed from there, uh, recruited Casey Grillo, who formerly of Camelot, who's now with, uh, he's touring for Queensryche, um, Danny Miles of July Talk, Tim Alexander, Bron Daler, Mike Wangren, <laughs> it just kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so word of mouth and, and some helpful recruiting through different drum companies, um, like Vader uh, Percussion has been helpful with me, Sabian, uh, Evans, uh, well, yeah, I guess it would be Diderio, but they've all been helpful. And, you know, if there's someone who's coming to town that I, I want to work with, um, you know, if, if they're one of their artists, they'll usually reach out to them for me and put us in touch. And, you know, we take it from there. So, yeah, that, that's yeah. really cool. So, so it started off through just sending a DM through Twitter to set up this yep. research date. And then after that, it's just word of mouth that kind of spread. And, and plus, too, you build a relationship with some of these people in these companies. So it, yes. it, that's that's really cool how all that worked out. Yeah, it's it's been really great. And, it, you know, it's it's funny because this, this particular project wasn't even the reason why Mike and I got in touch in the first place. It was about some other, like, more lab-based um, biomechanics stuff mm -hmm. that uh, – that I was originally interested in and still am interested in. Um, but this kind of came out of all of that and has really taken off. Um, and I've been able to leverage this to run a couple other projects as well um, that are more in the in the vein of the, the ergonomics and biomechanics injury prevention type stuff. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just been a, it's been a really neat experience. And I, it's, I've, uh, you know, you always hear what a small world things are, but I, I can't, I still marvel at how small and tight knit the drumming community is. Yeah. I mean, everybody knows everybody. It's, it's crazy. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, which has been very helpful for me, but, um, but also very neat, you know? Yeah. That's one of, uh, I, I talk about that a lot on this show and the show I had before this is that's one of the big things about the drumming community is you would think, you know, you will never get to meet everybody, of course, but at the same time, like it's so close knit. Like once you meet two or three people, you meet 20 or 30 people and it keeps adding up over and over like that. And you build these great relationships with people and it's such yeah. a humble community as well as, is how I would look at it. Absolutely. That's, that's something else that's really been, uh, I've been blown away by is how, uh, I don't even know what the word is, friendly, awesome, uh, but just supportive and, and um, really positive that the, the drumming community is. Um, everybody, it seems like there's very little in the way of competition. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, certainly, you know, there's probably a little bit of that, but it, it just seems like everybody is so willing to um, promote and praise everybody else and, and, you know, have good things to say about other people and, and just be supportive. It's, it's been really, really great um, and really nice to see. Yeah. Now, I, I always pick, I think about, you know, if, if you've got a guitar player off to the side that's, you know, got this cool lick he's playing, he's going to kind of like go off to the side, don't want anybody to see it, he's not going to share yeah. it, but when you got your drummer buddies around, it's like, man, we're going to get around in a circle, and we're going to learn this thing together. And, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. So, talking about how you do these measurements and everything, what equipment yeah. are you using to gather these measurements? So for the energy expenditure study, I use uh, two pieces of equipment, basically. Um, the first is a heart rate monitor, which is just a, a strap that goes around your chest. They're 
commercial. I use their I use Polar Brand, um, and they're available at uh, you know Source for Sports or online Sport Check in Canada. You know, it's a commercially available device, but they are really great devices, especially the chest strap ones. Um, we use them in research all the time, um, and so I, I use that to monitor heart rate. Are they pretty then, accurate? Yeah, yeah, they are, um, because these ones actually, um, they're not the optical kind, like, you know, like, the ones that are embedded in a wristwatch or an arm strap, those are, they use, like, infrared sensors to detect the pulsing of the blood through your veins, essentially, mm -hmm. and so they're a little less accurate than actually detecting the electrical signal of the heart, which is what the chest strap does, um, so, uh, but I mean, how how much difference there is between the two, I, I don't really know because I've never used the optical one. This is just what colleagues have told me um, about the two. But we do use, uh, I went with a chest strap because that's what, like I said, that's what we have in our labs. And that's what a lot of my colleagues use in their research. So, um, so I went with that. Um, and then the energy expenditure, I use a device called the Body Media Armbands. Um, these are, they actually used to be also commercially available. They're not anymore because they were bought out and discontinued. Um, but a lot of labs still have them and, and we use them with other researches that we do as well. Um, but basically it's a device that's maybe like an inch and a half by an inch and a half square and it goes on a Velcro band around your upper arm. Mm -hmm. And it has four different sensors inside uh, that measures uh, motion through an accelerometer. It measures sweating through a galvanic skin response sensor. It measures uh, skin temperature and heat flux, like the rate that you're dissipating body heat. Oh, wow. And it takes all those measurements, and there's uh, software that comes with it, and the algorithm within that software uses those measurements to provide the estimate of energy expenditure. And you got to put in some things like uh, the person's height and body mass and some other things like yeah. that, age, um, to account for all of that as well. Um, but uh, those, uh, yeah, so that's what I use for the energy expenditure. And I chose those because they, uh, they're really unobtrusive. It's, it's, like a, it's like wearing a sweatband around your arm. So there's no wires to get in the way. There's no cables to get in the way. Um, there's no, um, there's, there's another device that like, I wish I could use because it would be more accurate, to be honest. But it is like a, a gas mask, basically. So it's a, a gas analyzer that ad estimates your energy expenditure based on your carbon dioxide and oxygen consumption. Yeah. Or carbon dioxide release and oxygen consumption. But who wants to wear, a, you know, a big mask with the pack, you know, backpack? While, while they're playing in front of all the people, right? Exactly. There might be a few, but it'd be a much harder sell. <laughs> you know, I saw, I think, I know there's a, a mask that you can wear like that that helps you build endurance. I've seen Barry Kirch from uh, good grief. Shinedown. Yeah, from Shinedown. I've seen him on Instagram before wearing one, like when he was training. You know what I'm? Really? You know what I'm talking about? I I had to have to look at that. I don't know what exactly that is. My thinking is that that's maybe the the, the analyzer that or I'm talking about. It could be that. About. Yeah. Um, because that would give you a reading of what your oxygen consumption is and ha knowing that information can help you train and um, like know where you need to get to sort of thing. Gotcha. Um, so it's possible that he's done some of that. He, I have actually worked with Barry and he never mentioned that. So I'll have to ask, I'm going to see him in a couple weeks. I'm going to have to ask him. About it. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'll now see. I'm curious. I want to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So that's the reason why I use those instead um, because using that mask on stage would be, like I said, a, a harder sell. And also, I mean, there are ways where you can, you know, relate the heart rate measure to the mask estimates, but you need to get them in your lab to do a, uh, like a running test to exhaustion first. And that's really difficult with drummers who are on tour, even if they'd be willing to do that on a day of a show, it's really difficult when they're not getting in to the venue until, you know, four or five in the morning and they got to get sleep and they've got sound check and meet and greets. And, like, there's no time for this. They're so, like, what does this girl want me to do today, really? Right, exactly. <laughs> so this, this is sort of the, the, the best way to get at this kind of data while still managing, you know, or, or and keeping doing it in such a way that people would be willing to do it because it doesn't take a lot of time. The setup is, <clears throat> it takes us maybe maybe 10 minutes if we get chatty <laughs> while we're putting these things on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've done, I've, I've gotten people set up in the 20 minutes in changeover between bands. 
you know, like it's, it's really fast. So that, that makes it nice too. Um, you know, it's not very demanding on them. Then they forget that it's there while they're playing. So yeah, it's user friendly. Well, what about explain to us, uh, I guess uh, these measurements as far as, uh, the different categories. So you've got average show intensity. So yes. what would that be? Okay, so what I do is my the armbands give me um, the the total calories for the duration of the show, and so what I do is I divide that total calories expended or total total calories used divide that by the total time of the show, and that gives me a rate of calories per minute. So I refer to that as the intensity because the more calories you're burning per minute, the harder you're working. Mm-hmm. So it's more intense. So um, that total, that average show intensity refers to sort of the average number of calories burned per minute throughout the duration of the show. Now, if you look at it um, song by song, you can, and I, I, and if you've seen my graphics, you've seen like the bar charts where you, you can see sort of yeah. that's showing, that's the same data, but for each individual song. So I take the number of calories burned during a particular song and divide it by the length of the song, and I get the intensity or the calories per minute for each song. So that will vary considerably during a show because, you know, you get a a really high intensity, you know, all out rock song and the intensity goes way up. And then you follow that up with a ballad or two and it goes way down, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you can see the changes throughout the show. Um, But so, yeah, I list the average intensity so you can kind of get a sense of in general, how hard they're working throughout the show. And then I give the the song by song breakdown so you can see the, the variation over the course of the night. Yeah. Now with that over time, after you've recorded that, uh, that part of the information, would you say like, what is, uh, what would be the average calories burned within a minute off of everybody? Um, it varies, but I would say on average, most of the drummers I've worked with, or the average would be somewhere in the, let's see. 9, 10, 11 calories per minute, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's not, yeah. that's not too it's bad. Lot. I mean, that's, that's, that's getting it, right? Oh, yeah. Um, if you, so I, when I do my, my analysis and I do a write-up for, for each drummer, um, I, I try to compare it to uh, the intensity that someone of a similar body mass would, would achieve doing just regular exercise or different types of exercise. And a lot of, they're usually in the ballpark of like a, um, you know, it'd be similar to sitting on a, using a stationary rower at a vigorous intensity or a moderate intensity for the same amount of time. So if they're playing for 90 minutes, it'd be like doing 90 minutes of rowing at a, at a moderate intensity, which is way less fun. Yeah. (laughs) Um, That's pretty cool. uh, eh? Yeah, so it's it's around there, and the different songs, you know, depending on the song intensities, you know, there have been a few that have gotten up to where it would be comparable to running like a a twelve minute mile pace yeah. for the same amount of time, or you know, things like that. So I try to relate it to activities that we we tip or usually think of in terms of energy expenditure, and you know, they're they're very comparable to other forms of exercise. Mm-hmm. So next on that list, after after average show intensity, you have average heart rate, of course. So yes, that's self-explanatory. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, time in vigorous intensity. Yes. Okay. So the American College of Sports Medicine um, has these categories of intensity of activities based on how what your heart rate is in relation to your maximum possible heart rate. So um, that that number varies for every person, and the only way to really tell what your true max is is to get someone in the lab and make, do them to that, that test to exhaustion. But a fairly good um, surrogate for, for predicting your max heart rate is um, using your age. There are some equations that we can use to estimate your max heart rate based on your age. The most common one is 220 minus your age. There's a couple others that um, get you in the same ballpark as well. Um, so what um, what I do is I, I take the, the drummer's heart rate and I um, basically divide it by what their age predicted max would be. And then I calculate how much time they're spending in each of those categories defined by the ACSM. 
So vigorous intensity is anywhere from 74, let me, let me, let me make sure I get this right. I believe it's 74 to 95% of your max heart rate, um, which the current guidelines um, for recommendations for how much exercise a healthy adult should be getting every week is 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity. So that's anywhere from, I think it's 64 to 95% of your max heart rate. Hmm. It's usually get 150 minutes a week to be considered like, okay, you're, you're meeting the target for maintaining uh, some, to get health benefits. Yeah. And my, the drummers that I've worked with are getting that, that and more sometimes, well, not more, but they're getting at least half of that meet the recommendation in one show, typically. Oh, wow. So when you think about, you know, a, a drummer on tour is probably playing three to four shows a week, they're getting double the weekly recommendation in, in a typical week just from just from playing their shows. Yeah. So that's and it's important to know that for two reasons. One is um, that drumming is exercise. So if you are someone who doesn't want to sit on a rowing machine, or doesn't want to go for a run like me. I hate running. <laughs> um, love exercise, but not that kind. Um, then this is a this is a good alternative. If you're into music and you uh, you know want to give something like this a try, playing the drums can be exercise. It is a vigorous activity. But the other point that I I use this to make or make this point to drummers is if you are a professional drummer. And not even necessarily like, you know, playing these huge rock shows or whatever, but if this is something that you're doing on a regular basis, the point is to, sh to show them that this is very demanding on your body. I mean, some of these guys are operating at heart rates, you know, 160, 170, 180 beats per minute. Oh. That is really high. Resting heart rate 60 to 100. Yeah. So if you're going to push your body to work that hard, you have to train your body to be able to handle it. So before you go out on tour, not only should you be practicing your songs and, and, you know, in rehearsals with your band, but you better be on a treadmill or doing something <laughs> to train your body so that you can meet the demands that you're going to be putting on it that many times a week. That's crazy. Just like naturally. Yeah, that's crazy to think that your heart rate gets that high. Last, uh, last year, I was doing this, uh, like I, I ride a bike most mostly about every morning i do about 10 to 12 miles when i first wake up in the morning or or either i'll go jog and mm -hmm. um we we're talking about resting heart rate last year i ac i had an accident where my potassium had dropped very low from doing a specific diet and having too many uh or too much caffeine and my heart had went into afib so oh, my resting heart rate for the day that it happened was like 155 just sitting still Whoa. I had to go to yeah. the hospital and have, uh, you know, get a drip. It was a medication called Cardizin that dropped my heart rate down and everything. And ever since I went and had it put back in rhythm, I, I haven't had any more issues with that. You know, I mm -hmm. totally fixed my diet and got back into uh, to exercise on a, on a normal routine and everything. But uh, that's something that oh. I could tell now like after getting back to everything and working out and exercising now if i go play uh these cover gigs where you know i'm looking at a four-hour show most of the time mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't i don't burn out as quick off of it as, yeah. as what i used to and i guess it's from that conditioning every day of building that endurance up absolutely i don't it's think so... I, I don't think i'm going like my, i don't think my heart rate's getting as high as what you're saying with with the rock drummers because i'm playing in a more relaxed env environment but if i was <laughs> playing maybe you know a full out like rock or metal show or something like that then i'm sure it would probably you know get up to that point yeah you know i actually that's sort of um not really the next step but a, another step that i want to take is um, you know, getting data on drummers who are doing, you know, all night long events or cover gigs where they're playing, you know, three, four hours in a night. Um, you know, they do get breaks, but they're playing an hour and a half before they stop or something like that. Like that's a long time. Yeah. So I, I would, I, and so I go to the example of my brother-in-law, you know, he, he plays, he plays a wedding 
he's playing for, he says, you know, three to four hours, depending on, you know, how much they mix in a DJ. <clears throat> but he has to wear a suit. <laughs> it's a wedding band. So, well, they're not a wedding band, but that, you know, it's a, it's a wedding gig. So they're not wearing, you know, he's not wearing shorts and a like sleeveless dry fit shirt. He's yeah. wearing a three piece suit. <laughs> yeah. play. That's a lot. That's, you know, it's hard to dissipate body heat through a three piece suit. So, you know, getting that kind of information, um, on this whole other sub subset of drummers um, who do longer gigs, maybe the intensity isn't up there like a metal show would be, but it's still it's a long gig, it's a lot of playing, and that kind of music's energetic too. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's it probably is still up there pretty high. Um, you know, I, I couldn't really hazard a guess because everyone's different, but I, yeah. I would, you know, I would think it would still be well above resting heart rate um you know still well into the 120s 130s 140s yeah uh, but uh, i don't know yet so once i get some of those drummers i will start uh putting that out there too yeah i, I would be interested to see that kind of data that that would be really cool um when you examine each of these drummers does uh, does diet play a factor in your measurements and also like you know i guess if the drummer is a on a clean diet versus someone who isn't on a diet at all and plus does tobacco and alcohol consumption does that play a major role in in this as well is, is i guess it is that something that you take in account whenever you're doing these measurements mm -hmm. um i don't i don't ask them about those things um they're not taken into account in the measurements like i told you about the algorithm for the software that estimates energy expenditure yeah um Actually, smoking goes into that. I do ask them if they smoke or not. So that goes in as one of the variables for the, the calculations. But in terms of their diet or whether they've had caffeine or any other substances or they didn't sleep well that night or that sort of thing, um, I don't ask them about those things um, because I don't want – and I and so a standard practice in a study like this would probably be to ask them to refrain from – energy drinks, caffeine, alcohol, like all those things, right? I don't do that because I want them in their natural state. Yeah. If you have two Red Bulls before every show, I don't want you to not do that because I'm there because then well, the readings that I'm getting are not reflective of what is typical for you in a show. So I don't I don't factor that in or ask them to change any of their pre-show habits or, or during show habits for that matter if they go on stage with a drink like, that's what they do. Yeah. So I, I leave it at that. Um, could it have an impact on the data? Certainly. Um, absolutely things like uh, caffeine, nicotine, all of that would have an impact, especially on your resting heart rate. Um, in terms of the heart rate that they're playing at, given the intensity of the activity, I don't think that they, I think even if they didn't, have any of those substances they still be pushing well into where they're getting anyway so I, I think the vigor of the activity is enough to overcome any inflation of their heart rate because they had a coffee or, or a red bull or yeah. something like that. um so yeah i but, but like i said most importantly I, I want them because this data is i mean it's interesting for the public to see but it's also information for them i want them to see what's happening to them during their show um, and, and that wouldn't be accurate if I asked them to change a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so I don't do that. Yeah, definitely. And I'm actually, uh, I work one day a week with a podiatrist right now and he does a lot of minimally invasive foot surgery mm -hmm. and you're like, where is this going? <laughs> but no, we're doing, I'm actually helping him on a research project right now. And just cool. w with you talking about all this, you know, about not making any changes and you have to take an account for the way something is just the way that it is like there's no changes to it same way with what we're doing between these two procedures right now for this research trying to figure out what the benefits are if you know which procedure would be the best we're just mm -hmm. having to take these x-rays and im angles and everything and collect all this data just as it is no changes of asking anybody anything different you know and, mm -hmm. and that's just the <clears throat> truth behind it and I know, yeah. I know with all this, uh, 
w- with all the research you're doing, this is something that's going to take a long time to be able to put out there too, right? Um, with this particular project, I'm trickling it out as they come in. So I uh, usually, I mean, depends on how busy I get. I'm kind of backlogged right now because I had a lot of drummers over the summer. But um, I try to get their results out within like a, a month or so of the show. So everybody I've worked with, I'm almost completely caught up, but almost everybody that I've worked with, their data is already out on my social media. Um, and some of it's, I'm slowly trickling out on Drumeo too. They've been publishing the results on their, their blog, um, mm-hmm. the Drum Feed. So that's all out there already. In terms of if I publish it as like an academic study, yeah, that would take a while because you want to collect, uh, I, I probably have enough that I could publish it in that format already. Um, but I'm, I'm less, oh, dare I say it, I'm less interested in publishing this in that forum um, than I am in, in the way I'm doing it now because I think it has more impact to get it out to, if I publish, it has more impact to get it out to the public in this way. If I publish it in an academic journal, it's tied up there. And unless you have a subscription to that journal or have a, you know access to a library that has a subscription to that journal, you're not going to be able to read it. Yes. So who is that really benefiting? Very true. Yeah, just (laughs) just a few faces, a few people. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, I I may publish it at some point, but um, I'm I'm happier putting this information out this way. Uh, Some of my other work, I'm I'm doing both. I'm publishing, um, you know, the some of the lab based research that I'm doing, uh, we're putting that out into journals as well, but I'm also presenting it at conferences. I'm presenting at uh, PASIC in November. Um, and uh, I will eventually, actually I have published some of the results on you know different articles and blogs and things like that. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's just as important, if not more important, to get that information out to where it's publicly accessible. Um, than it is to bury it in an academic journal that nobody but academic read, academics read. So <laughs> yeah. it, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I, I, I'm glad that you're sharing that with everybody, you know, cause uh, I, I do think there's something, there's something revealing about it, you know, that it, to me and from what I've seen, you're the only person that I know of this doing this kind of thing right now. Unless I um, like just haven't seen anyone else, but right now you're the only person that I've noticed that's doing this kind of research. I, I do see people doing research on on injuries and things, but yeah, uh, there's even very little of that. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think actively right now I might be the only one doing it. The Klemberg Drumming Project did very similar work, um, and they were really the basis for this project um, about ten years ago not quite 10 years ago, maybe around there. Um, and I know uh, Marcus Smith, who was the lead author on that project, um, they are doing some data collection now. Um, it's a little bit different than what I'm doing. It's actually really interesting stuff. They're, I can't remember the name of the guy they're working with right now, other than Klemberg. But they're looking at, I think, um, some blood pressure response yeah. during live shows and also some like blood lactate and some other like metabolic markers. Um, so that'll be, I'm excited to see that data when it comes out, cause that'll be really interesting. Um, there've been a couple other lab studies that have done similar work as well, but, um, I think other than myself and Marcus, I don't think anybody else is doing this kind of work. Um, as far as the injury stuff goes, I haven't seen anybody doing drumming injury work besides myself. But if you know something, let me know because I'd like to look into it. I do. I, I was going to mention that to you. I don't. I'll say that what I do know is there's a guy that I'm friends with named Brandon Green, and he has a YouTube channel. Yeah, and he's yeah. from Canada as well. I know Brandon. I've spoken to Brandon. Yep. So yeah, he deals with drum mechanics. Uh, yes. So basically, Sorry. It, no. That his. I won't say that he's doing a lot of research on it, but I, I think he's doing a lot of preventative work. Yes, he is. And that's why when you said research, that's I was thinking research projects on injury prevention. And that's why I'm like, I don't think anybody is. But yes, Brandon is doing a lot of work um, it, with uh, injury prevention um, from uh, very much a similar perspective, like a training perspective and yeah. a mechanics and, and changing um, 
you know, changing your body mechanics to eliminate stresses, unnecessary stresses on tissues to prevent injury. So yeah, he is doing a lot of work um, in that direction. Yeah, him. And then there was another guy that was on uh, on Drumeo a while back. Let's see. His name was John Lamb, and he has a book that's called uh, Anatomy of Drumming. I don't know if you've seen that or not. I have a copy of it on my bookshelf in oh. my office. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And that's the <laughs> only two okay. names that come to mind for that kind of stuff. Yeah, so yeah, I have read John's book. So similar concept. I know Dave Elich um, does a lot with uh, with ergonomics in his uh I've never spoken to him personally. I'm looking forward to hopefully meeting him at PASIC, but I, I know he does a lot with, with body mechanics in his teaching. Um, uh, who else? Mike Mike Schwartz, um, who's another Canadian, similar sort of like health and injury prevention consultant for not just drummers, a lot of like all musicians, but he does, he is a drummer himself, so he, mm. you know, gravitates to that too. Um, so yeah, there are people who are working towards the prevention stuff, but I think I might be the only one who's doing like scientific research on it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but hopefully more people will start to because the more people who are doing it, the the more information comes available, and the better the better the evidence base is for the recommendations that people are making to help people prevent injury. Yeah, and like sitting here talking to you. My brain's turning, thinking about you know if if we have someone like you collecting the data, and then if you have people like Brandon and John, you know, if, if you create a whole team, which of course we know how the drumming community is, where people would love to work together. If if yeah. we could do that and come out with some type of you know videos or books or anything like that to uh, mm-hmm. to help help make this career a lot longer for for each of us you know I I think that would be something great off of it Mm -hmm. yeah definitely Um, yeah we actually um, one of my grad students and I are just wrapping up an article that we're writing for Dremio on um, some tips for how to manage um, two of the more common drumming related injuries Um, so we're we're trying to trickle out some of that information as well but yeah definitely um, you know, as we get more and more information to be able to collaborate with other people to put it into a delivery format would be amazing. Yeah, and I guess, like, what is what is the ultimate goal w- with all of this, you know, as far as collecting all this data and doing all this research? Is this something that's kind of a, a secret, or is this something that you're you're wanting to talk about to put out later? Uh, you know, I don't have a specific, like, end product, this is where it's all, you know, it's going to be packaged into this, like, three DVD set, or, you know, <laughs> nothing like that. Um, <laughs> that's certainly not, not necessarily, you know, the mandate here. No, my, my goal is, uh, if you want my sort of, like, catchphrase, whatever, it's my goal is to do for drummers what sports science has done for athletes. Okay. And that is to help people achieve their peak performance while preventing injury. Um, so that, uh, that's way too big of a job for one person. Um, you know, the sports science world is massive. Um, and there's a lot of great knowledge from there that can be translated into an activity like drumming. Um, but act- drumming is a very unique activity. And so it needs to be studied in, in unique ways to capture those, those nuances. Um, but yeah, my, my goal is just to continue doing as much research as I can and keep disseminating it to as many people as I can so that ultimately, um, you know, drummers everywhere may find some kernel of wisdom in there that helps them make that one change that stops them from getting tendonitis or, or keeps them from developing carpal tunnel syndrome or, you know, whatever the case may be, or even just if it just smooths out their mechanics so they're playing better, yeah. you know, from a performance standpoint. Um, you know, any anything that I can put out there that might help someone is, you know, a good thing. So yeah. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing, and hopefully people will find, uh, find value in it. And, um, you know, eventually down the line, if all that culminates in some kind of, delivery method like whether it's a an online video or a youtube channel or um you know consulting like one-on-one consulting that kind of thing then you know that's that's all definitely on the table as possibilities but for now because this is so new i'm still just sort of 
trying to get a footing on like, okay, where, what do we need and where do we go from here? Um, <clears throat> so that's what we're working on now. That was the study that I talked to you about that I said I, I was, um, have already submitted to a journal is, um, a study I did about a year ago, I ran a big survey, um, online survey about people's experiences with drumming related injuries and specifically overuse injuries like, yeah. uh, uh, tendonitis and muscle soreness and not, not, you know, you know, bashing your fingers against the rim of your snare or something like that. Yeah. More the chronic overuse injuries. Uh, I had over 800, I was 831 usable responses from drummers all over the world. Um, and so that was really great because it gave me a really good sense of what are, you know, how common are injuries? The answer is very common. Um, <laughs> what are the most common types of injuries? What are people learning about how to prevent them? If anything, what are, and then a whole bunch of stuff about risk factors. What are their practice habits, performance habits? How do you set up your kit? How many pieces are in your kit? All these things that I can then relate to the rates of injuries to see if I can't find a relationship between um, you know, these different risk factors or protective factors and reporting or not reporting injury. Um, so that was sort of our foundational study. And now we're taking that information and moving forward with what we kind of saw were the big areas of where we might be able to make the most impact um, or where there's the most need for more research. So yeah. that's what we're doing now. That's cool. Yeah. And I think about like, I know I probably didn't have the best technique playing until I got into college. And I had mm -hmm. I had one of my instructors work with me a lot, and that's something I think we're most instructors are doing a pretty good job as far as teaching good technique and how you can you know set up your kit or how you work with rebound off of the drum head or practice pad to be able to mm -hmm. prevent those injuries, and, which is a great thing. But also to have all this information and this data collected, we could even pinpoint things even farther you know mm -hmm. th than just does this hurt or you know are, are you sore you know we, we would have yeah. more of a definite answer to everything and, and how yeah. to fix that yeah and and that's that was the goal with that study is to try to sort of dig into some of that um in particular i'm really interested in what um what people are being taught about injury prevention um and I'm actually working with that information now, so I don't have any good answers for you yet. But I, uh, I was at the NAMM show last year, and I was interviewing drummers on their experiences with playing-related injuries. I was uh, doing this for Drum Talk TV as part of their coverage of the event. And I, I think I interviewed 27 different people, and so many of them um, said, you know, if I asked them, you know, were you taught anything about how to prevent injury? Like, no, no. <laughs> There are so many, um, you know, who had said that they weren't taught anything about that and they kind of had to learn it the hard way. Um, so, you know, getting better in, I think that's changing. I think people are much more aware now of just how demanding drumming is. And so there, I think you're right. I think a lot more people are being taught um, at least some general information about like, you know, this shouldn't hurt. If you're starting to feel burning, if you're feeling sore, you know, something's got to change. You got to stop. You got to take a break. You know, I, I think, which is great. Um, but you're right. If we can get more specific information for them about, you know, here's how you need to set up your drum drum, you know, yeah. not specific angles or heights, but in terms of like how, it, like how it feels for your body. Same way we have guidelines for how to set up an office chair. You know, your knees should be at 90 degree angle. You should have at least a fist distance between the back of your knee and the front of the chair. You know, general guidelines like that, that we can give to people to say like, you know, this is how, at least here's the starting point. Then you need to adjust it to be more comfortable for you. But here's generally where you need to be. Um, I don't think a whole lot of that exists right now. I could be wrong, but I, I don't, I haven't heard from many people that there's this, oh yeah, this is the guiding principle sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh I also get a lot of questions about that. So that's how I know that there's maybe not. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> People wouldn't be asking me if they knew. Um, so, uh, yeah, to be able to get some more concrete information out to people to help prevent this from the beginning. It, it's so much easier to prevent an injury than it is to fix one. Um, but to prevent one, you have to know what causes it first. So that's that's where we're at. What causes it so that we can figure out how to prevent it. Yeah. What does, what does the next five to ten years 
look like for you with it, with everything you've got going on now? Yeah. Um, well, the energy expenditure study has at least two more years left in it. Um, and depending on interest, uh, people ask me all the time, like, how long are you going to do this? I'm going to say, until, until there's no drummers left who want to know. <laughs> but, um, no, uh, you know, it depends at least two more years, and then we'll see what, what the interest and demand looks like um, and continue. I may not continue it as a study. Maybe I'll just continue it as a general interest thing. Um, but, I mean, for the next five to ten years for me is, yeah, just getting in the lab and, um, you know, getting research done that I can then, get it, the results out to the public so that they can use them. Um, it's hard to be more specific than that. I guess I could say I've got <clears throat> I've got a couple of grad students working with me now. Um, they're going to be looking at things like, um, one of them is going to be looking at uh, upper limb vibration exposure in drummers. Mm. Uh, because we know that being exposed to vibration, uh, vibration is a uh, risk factor for injury. So he's going to be looking at vibration exposure in drummers when they're playing. I have another student who is going to be looking at muscle activation patterns uh, in drummers, looking in particular for a specific type of activation pattern that we see in elite athletes when they have to do very forceful, powerful movements like a punch or a kick or something like that. Yeah. And we want to see if that exists in elite drummers as well. Um, and uh, I have a student who just wrapped up a project looking at the um, positioning of the upper limb while playing drums. So we're looking at the shoulder, elbow, and wrist joint angles um, while playing the drums to see how long people are spending outside of a, a neutral, or basically what are the postures that people are getting into and how long are they spending you know, outside of a, a more neutral position, which when you're non-neutral postures, awkward postures are a risk factor for injury. So we want to see what's happening there because upper limb injuries came out by far as the most common um, injured, most commonly injured body region. Yeah. It was the upper, it was like 59% of my sample had an upper limb injury at some point. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So that's a lot. That is. Yeah. So those are kinds of things that we're, we're working on in the, in the near future. So those would be over the next like, three to five years and then as I add more students to the lab and more questions come up that's the great thing about research is you answer one question and you develop three more in the process <laughs> so, so I don't know exactly where it's going to go but I know we'll we'll have places or, or things to investigate so yeah and, and with this new research you were you were just talking about like with vibration studies and and, and with mm -hmm. the muscles and everything I also feel that maybe this might unlock the door for beginning drummers as maybe even well, we might learn that there are shortcuts to being able to play certain like play certain rudiments differently to be able to access them a lot easier than if we didn't know this information or how to play faster and more efficiently you know what i mean yeah. so not just for i mean of course we want to we would love to have this to prevent injuries but also i'm thinking you know, maybe this might improve playing as well as far as making things easier for everyone. You know, it's almost like thinking of it as a shortcut, you know. So there's no telling what this stuff could reveal. Exactly. And uh, that's a good point about actually those those first two studies that I talked about. Yeah, the vibration one is maybe more geared towards injury prevention. But the other study on muscle activation is more so geared about towards performance. Yeah. Um, and technique development um, as something to potentially strive for, but that's what that's what we have to investigate. Um, so, yeah, I definitely have interest in developing both sides of that coin um, because, and I also think that one feeds into the other. I mean, I think if you if you can be targeted in how you develop your technique, then you're less likely to spend time doing stuff that might put you at risk of injury and overtraining and you know all that kind of stuff. Um, because that's a, a big part of what these injuries are. They're, they're over, it's overuse, which means overtraining in a lot of cases. Um, you know, practicing for too long without taking a break, practicing too many hours a day too quickly instead of ramping up slowly, um, practicing inefficiently, doing stuff for a long time because like, you know, you've got to put in your hours. It's like, well, there's probably a better way to do that. Um, you know, more, you know, less time spent, but more impact in terms of your development. All of these things are things that 
you know, the, the sports world has been working on for years and they've made lots of headway in that direction. Um, but none of that has translated into, um, the drumming world yet. So that's definitely something that I think where we could, you know, make an impact too. Yeah. I'm very, very excited to see this, uh, this information you gather over the next few years and I'm glad you're doing this. I, I appreciate your work on it and I'm sure everyone out there that that's learning about this, uh, I'm thinking, you know, that they totally will be excited and happy about this as well. So Well, thank you very much. I have I've been really having a great time doing all of this work and uh yeah, I I'm looking forward to, to continuing to do it over many, many years. And if people want to get involved in my work, they can they can find me through the university website or through my social media um, because a lot of my studies do take place at the university but some of them I you know for touring drummers if they're in my area then we can we can do the live stuff or there will be some research coming down the line where like the surveys or if there's interviews or things like that where people from all over the world can get involved so um, yeah I want to involve as many people as I can because the more people uh, we get in the more representative it is of, of more drummers yeah, and I'm I will have all that information in in the show notes as well, where everyone can find that, so they can well, get in touch yeah. with you. Um, Great. I got a few more questions to hit you up, more personal than uh, <laughs> than about the research. So when you're right. when you're not working and doing all this research and everything, what are you doing in your downtime? Oh well, <laughs> you're like what downtime? What is what that? What downtime? Um, well, I I would have said go to concerts but I do that a lot now anyway so um it's been a while since I've been to a concert just for the sake of going um but uh yeah no in my downtime I have two kids um so spend a lot of time as a family mm -hmm. um I uh I play sports I play volleyball um not as much lately but I volleyball is my my go-to sport um, I exercise at the gym. I like weight training. I hate cardio. I've already mentioned that, but I do love weights. Um, so that's something I do in my spare time. And, uh, and I'm a reader. I read a lot. So that's, uh, when I get quiet time, that's usually what I, what I gravitate towards. <laughs> it's kind of like a meditation kind of thing too, right? Just being able to, to be by yourself or, or be one with the book and, and shut out everything else. Right. Yeah, just escape into a, a totally different world and uh, and go down that road. Yeah, or movies. I love movies too. So, but reading is definitely I can do that for a lot longer. <laughs> what kind of movies? Um, well, comedies usually yeah. a comedy. I love like things like Couples Retreat or Forgetting Sarah Marshall or things like that. Just yeah. something that'll make me laugh. Um, I hate horror movies. I have way too vivid of imagination. I don't need fuel for it. Yeah. Um, so that's not my thing. Um, I love, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that I love fantasy, except I think I kind of do because I, Harry Potter, I've watched those movies millions of times and that has nothing to do with my children. That's all me. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I love that. Um, the Outlander series, any historical fiction and fantasy mixture is like, it was like it was custom written for my interests, so I love that. Cool. Um, yeah, those are those are kind of the big ones. But yeah, I generally I like either that kind of stuff <clears throat> or comedy. I, I'm not a big fan of things like uh, uh, like really serious, like thought provoking, <laughs> like yeah. like sci type stuff or or thrillers. Like I said, I don't know. I think too much during the day if I'm looking for entertainment. <laughs> I don't want to have to think too hard about it. <laughs> yeah, you know, life's too short to be too serious. We need to just laugh and have a good time, right? That's right. Yeah. You were you were speaking on horror movies. I I grew up loving horror movies my whole life. So no, but I, I'm yeah. also a big comedy fan as well. I, I enjoy yeah. that stuff. So, what kind of goals do you have for yourself <clears throat> that are not career related? Oh my goodness! <laughs> I'm just pulling it out, right? Yeah. Um, geez, what kind of goals do I have for myself? Um, you know, now that my kids are getting older, getting back into the things that I used, well, used to love, but still love, but used to spend a lot more time doing. 
um, and, and developing some new interests. I, over the last couple of years, I started painting, oh. um, which I'm not very good at it whatsoever, but it's fun and it's relaxing and I would like to get better, but like anything, it takes practice, yeah. um, which I don't have the time to dedicate to that right now. Um, and same thing with, with my instruments. I would really like to get back to playing the piano. Um, I took a few drum lessons over the summer, um, and, and I would love to play more, but again, just I'm not having the time it takes to put in the practice to get, you know, that much better. So, uh, over the next few years, as, as my kids get older and maybe, you know, are spending less and less time with us, then that there will be more time for that sort of thing. But um, that and traveling, I love travel. Yeah. So there are lots of places in the world that I want to get to. So that's really cool. Painting, yeah, and yeah. I think being able to create something. I mention this a lot on the show too. Is uh, yeah, I think that's a very important thing for all of us. Is is having that element of creating something from nothing, mm-hmm. and even if. It's something you feel you're not that great at at the moment. I feel that, you know, once you do it over and over and over and keep pulling, keep pulling from within like that, mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything out there like that. So, yeah, yeah. And it's definitely not something that uh, the painting in particular is something that is really good for me because I tend to be a perfectionist and you can't be a perfectionist when you're painting (laughs) or really doing anything creative um you know you just kind of got to let it happen and you have to be okay with like well that didn't work out start over which is really difficult for me (laughs) so uh but it it, that's why I like it so much I think because you know there aren't really any rules um Mm -hmm. so you just have to do it which is sort of scary, but is also like, that's a really, you know, in terms of broadening my horizons, that's been a really good thing about that too. So I look forward to doing that a little more. <clears throat> sounds like that would be the perfect balance with where everything that you're doing with, with your medical research and all that, that you have, you have to be like on point. Everything has to be precise on that. So with this, you can have what Bob Ross would call happy accidents, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Although, to be fair, this this whole drumming project turned started as a happy accident. Yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty apt, really. It's actually that's been a fun thing about this whole project too. Is of course, you know, scientifically you have to be rigorous and and consistent, but it's also been with with the more with the social media and the more, um, you know, direct to the public kind of, um, path that I've been taking. It's been very different from what I'm used to. So it's, it's been a really unique experience, a, a great learning experience because it's totally different from what I'm used to. Um, and, and it's been really great. So that's been a lot of fun, but yeah, happy accident. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind one day? Oh my God. Yeah. I, I think there's really two answers to that because I would want, there's like a professional legacy, but also a personal legacy. Yeah. And I, I would want uh, my professional legacy to be that I've, I've done something that uh, other people have can benefit from. And if, if it can help them or make their lives better in some way, then, then I think that would be, a great legacy. Um, personally speaking, um, to to know that I've that I guess my family and my friends, um, you know, know that I that I've been good a good person to them, that I've loved them, that they've felt that, um, and that, you know, that my kids when they when they're my age or whatever and they look back on their childhoods, they think like, wow, I you know, my parents were great. Then, you know, and not that that meant I gave them everything they wanted, but that, you know, I put them in line when they needed to, but also had a lot of fun with them. Yeah. You know, I just I want them to look back on that and and know that they were very much loved and that they had a great child and hopefully they think that they had a great childhood despite the fact that their parents work a lot yeah. <laughs> but um yeah so yeah two different legacies i guess i think that's great 
I, th- I really do. I think that's great. <clears throat> and and to close all this out, for everyone who's listening, what kind of advice would you give to help everyone in their everyday life? In their everyday life, okay. So not drumming specific. It, just... Yeah, just in life in general. What what's your best piece of advice you could give through your experiences? Take a chance. Take the chance. Um, because you never know what it's going to bring you. And, you know, so if there's something you feel like, oh, I think I want to try this, but I'm not sure, go for it. What's what's the worst that's going to happen? I mean, in some cases, maybe something really bad could happen. And maybe, <laughs> but, you know, in general, if it's something, you know, whether it's, you know, a, maybe a new business venture or starting a new activity or, uh, you know, asking that person out that you have a crush on, whatever it might be, you know, what's, what's the worst that's going to happen? You know, I, in my experience, you know, I, I almost didn't send that tweet to Mike Mangini because at the time I wasn't really big on interacting on social media and, and I don't know what made me do it, but I did. And if I hadn't, I wouldn't be here right now. And the last three years of my career and both personally and professionally have been incredible. And I would have missed out on all of that if I hadn't just sent it. And what the worst that would have happened was he would have ignored it and I would have just continued on with my life the way it was. That's right. You know, there was no risk there. So I, I would say just, yeah, take the chance. And you never know what's going to come out of it. Maybe it'll be something awesome. That's perfect. Great <laughs> advice. Great advice. Yeah. You're living proof of this, right? That's well, Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I, I'm happy. I'm very glad that you sent that DM that day. And maybe yeah. if maybe if you didn't, and maybe you would have sent one to someone else later on. You know, maybe you were maybe, maybe you're a determined person, and you would have done it regardless. So. Maybe we'll never know. But <laughs> I did, and, and I'm really glad I did for many many reasons. And uh, yeah, great. Hey. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for for talking talking with me today. And this is something, like I said, I I, I saw you on Twitter, and I thought this would be very very interesting to uh, to talk about. And also, like I have I'm not saying that I personally, but I'm in this group of drummers on Twitter where there's maybe thirty or forty of us. They conversate every week and and pitch ideas back and forth to each other, and to be mm-hmm. able to share this with everyone and, and and introduce you to my people, you know, I I just think this is going to be a really cool thing, and and maybe it might open a few doors to you being able to grow some relationships with people as well. So I, I really appreciate you being on here, and I thank you for it. Well, thank you for reaching out to me through Twitter and uh, for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. And I would be thrilled to network with the people in your group. And hopefully, you know, there's something in here that, you know, is helpful to them. And, yeah, we'll see where where everything takes us. Yeah. And thank for, you for having me. Say what now? I said thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. So for people that want to look you up and find out more information about you, Nadia, where would they need to go to? Um, Probably the best place to see uh, my day-to-day activities and and get the results from the the different research that I'm doing is on my social media. Um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram are the two that I'm most active on. I do have Twitter, but I I don't post there as much as I used to. Um, but my handle for all three is uh, at Dr. Nadia Azar. So, and it's the same for all of them. So you'll be able to find me there. Um, and my email address is listed, I believe, on all of those. Um, so they can send me a direct email to my, my university email account. Uh, I do have a web page through the University of Windsor. Um, that doesn't get updated as much as, um, you know, my social media does. So for more timely information, that's the place to go. But all my contact information is on my University of Windsor webpage as well, um, which I can, it's like a long link. I can yeah, give I'll you have that. I'll have it in the show notes. It's, it's not something simple. So, um, <laughs> yeah, those are those are the two best places, really. Perfect. I'll have that so everybody can look you up. And, uh, yeah, again, thank you so much for being on here, and I, I appreciate it. 
Well, thank you. It was great to be here, and uh, I'm sure we'll speak again at some point. Definitely. That's it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed my hang with Dr. Nadia Azar. If you would be so kind to go check her out at Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter at Nadia Azar. That's N-A-D-I-A-A-Z-A-R. Go check her out. Let her know what you thought about the podcast episode today. And again, this whole thing is about us building relationships with people within our community. So hope everyone enjoyed that. Be sure to go to iTunes and give us a five-star review and rating. That helps us show up for other drummers and people who are interested to be able to find the podcast. And this is the last episode with the weird panning issue. So next, everything's going to be on point. It will be in stereo. So if you're listening with headphones, you won't have one voice on the right, one voice on the left. Everything will all be basically in the center. So I was able to get the equipment I needed. I've got everything set up and ready to roll now for my next batch of episodes. And I can't wait to share those with you. So again, thank you so much for taking the time for investing in this show with me and listening. And until next time, I'll see you later.